The killing of George Floyd by Minneapolis cops has sparked an ongoing series of nationwide protests against police brutality. And it seems that a new consensus is forming around the urgent need for criminal justice reform. Six years ago, after the police killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, just 43% of Americans believe that such incidents were indicative of a systemic problem. Now, even though police killings have remained level since 2014, 69% of us agree that the killing of Floyd represents a broader problem within law enforcement. To better understand the shift in calls for police reform and what sorts of changes would be most effective, I sat down with the Washington Post opinion writer Radley Balco, a former reporter and senior editor at Reason who covers police abuse, the drug war, and criminal justice reform. His coverage of Corey May, a black man in Mississippi put on death row for killing a police officer during a no-knock raid, helped bring about May's acquittal. And his books, Rise of the Warrior Cop and The Cadaver King and the Country Dentist, reveal widespread problems with law enforcement and expert testimony. Radley Balco, thanks for talking to Reason. Uh, pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, you have been covering uh, the broad topics, the intersecting topics of the war on drugs, uh, police abuse, race issues in America for going on 20 years now at a variety of outfits, including the Cato Institute, Reason, Huffington Post, Washington Post. Why did the George Floyd killing, uh, do you think, explode into public consciousness the way that it did? I mean, I think it's really the power of video. Um, you know, if you go back to the civil rights movement, um, uh, you know, obviously there were civil rights abuses going on for a long time in our country's history. Um, but, you know, I think the, the organizers of the civil rights movement um, in the 60s really recognized the power of images. And uh, I think there were, you know, we know now looking at that history that um, a lot of the, the events or the protests that inspired these kind of iconic photos and videos were, you know, they knew there was going to be violence. They knew that um, the other side, like other term, were going to be provoked. And that was a strategy to kind of win over the middle and win over white America. And, you know, the George Floyd video is, I mean, it's indisputable, right? I mean, there have been attacks on Floyd's character, you know, whatever his decisions in life, but like that video, there is, there is no excuse for having your knee on a guy's neck for nine minutes. I mean, it's yeah. Just and it's, you know, I, I was, uh, when I first saw that, I was like, I, in my mind, I always go to the Rodney King beating video, which in a lot of ways is kind of the starting point of, uh, kind of citizen surveillance of police, uh, in a, in a modern context. And I can remember in the trial of the LAPD cops accused of beating Rodney King, uh, or not, I mean, they beat him, but of, of doing it in a, in a felonious way. The, the um, defense broke that video down in the original trial to show that actually they weren't beating him. And there was a broad kind of support of like, oh, well, you know, maybe the LAPD was doing OK. When uh, we look at Michael Brown or, the, or the, the, the riots or the protests that came out of Michael Brown and Ferguson in 2014, there was also this discussion of like, well, you know, on the one hand, the cops have to do this. And on the other with this Floyd, nobody's protecting him right? or nobody is uh, nobody is defending the police action. Is that a sign of progress, um, even as you know, we're in the middle of ongoing protests against police abuse? Um, I mean, I think it's a sign of progress. That there's been such a, a widespread sort of embrace of of the idea that police are systematically abusive. That that there's that the idea of racism in policing in America has crept into white America, into the suburbs. That you have now. If you remember, four years ago, the Democratic nominee for president couldn't say the phrase "Black Lives Matter" without qualifying it. Um, and a lot of people were like that. I, when I first heard the phrase, I, I, I thought, well, that's kind of a weird slogan, although now it makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, to now you have, you know, Mitt Romney saying it unsolicited. You have, um, you know, it's a, uh, you have people, you know, who probably haven't protested ever in their lives now joining this protest. So I think that sign of progress. I think, I think the, well, the, the role the video plays is that it, it, it like, like Michael Brown, uh, in Ferguson, St. Louis County, like a lot of, you know, Tamir Rice, um, of these incidents that have sparked sort of uprisings, you know, none of them are really about those cases in isolation, right? It, it, we, there have been unjustified killing, police killings of, you know, white and black people in cities all over the country over the last 20 years. 
where we see the uprisings tend to be in places that those those stories speak to people on a very personal level. Um, they, they tap into some some long simmering um, tension, resentment, pain, fear, despair, um, and so. You know, I think with Michael Brown, with um, uh, uh, like you said, even the Rodney King, I think the fact that the that the, the initial narrative then had some uh, qualifications or, or context that made it less compelling drew away from the fact, or, or gave sort of white people an excuse to sort of dismiss it all as um, not, you know, as a false narrative, as based on a false narrative, and actually sort of ignore the broader you know, long simmering, you know, anger and despair that led to the protest in the first place. In this case, there's no, there's no contextualizing that video. And so it's easier to kind of, you know, say, all right, I'm fully on board with this. What, you know, uh, critics of Black Lives Matter and of the protests more generally uh, talk about uh, two things. One, um, <clears throat> typically they'll say, OK, police abuse, you know, is what is is widespread, yet it's really an, indivi- an issue with individual police or individual cops. And also that race is not the issue here. It, it's it's something else. Um, they'll point to things and I'm, I'm uh, reading from a recent article in City Journal put out by the Manhattan Institute, but where in 1971, uh, the NYPD, the New York Police Department, uh, killed 93 people. In 2016, they killed nine, discharged their weapons 810 times in 1971, 72 times last year in 2016. And they'll say that they're just, you know, this is bad, but it is not a big scale problem. How do you how do you get across the idea that actually it is a large scale problem? So a few, uh, I think there are two different questions there. One about how systemic is is police abuse and police or violations in general, and then how how systemic is is race? Or race yeah, and let's let's separate the race to the to uh, uh, right. you know for a second here. So. so so my response to that is you know there are lots of different things that drive how many times police shoot people over the course of a year, including you know general crime rates, general sort of consensus about you know, how people's lives are, uh, you know, police attitudes, how many police officers are on the force, how well equipped they are, well trained they are. Um, you know, there was a lot of, a lot more violence period in the 1970s, um, and 1980s and up to the early 1990s. Um, you know, my, my measure of whether a system is corrupt is whether you can, uh, you can point to specific incidents where, you know, a bad apple or whatever you want to call it has clearly acted corruptly and in a, in a you know, violated somebody's constitutional rights um, and nothing is done about it. Um, you can say that bad cops are, are a tiny percentage of the overall force, but if the system isn't doing anything about those bad cops, or even if it, when it does, they can find a job, at, you know, a county or two over, um, I think you have a corrupt system. And, and you know, Yes, it's probably a small percentage of cops who kill people or, or shoot and kill other people or who are sort of blatantly racist. But there is an entire police culture of covering up of this idea that cops always should always look out for each other, that sort of the, the, the best interests of cops are, you know, prioritized over everything, um, justice over the community of people are supposed to be serving. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like there are lots of different ways that you can break down Police shootings, a lot of different ways you can crunch the data, a lot of ways you can try to like, you know, add or remove different variables. But if you have a system where even the sort of obviously corrupt people are very rarely held accountable, then I think you can say sort of unequivocally that that system itself is right. corrupt. And I think, you know, your focus on systems of policing and this, I'm thinking of your book, Rise of the Warrior Cop, where, you know, in the end, I mean, you you know, individuals, obviously, you know, we're both libertarian uh, uh, leaning or libertarian. Um, and so, you know, you want to prioritize or you want to you want to pay uh, uh, deference to people's individual actions. But when you're in a system that is so overwhelmingly pointed in one direction, the limit for the scope for individual action is, is by definition limited. Right. So, so, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, uh, as somebody who sort of vaguely came from the right and who finds, you know, less and less in common with the right. Um, but, you know, one point I've tried to make over the years, and I've tried to bring sort of people on the right along on these issues is that, you know, we and uh, people on the right, conservatives, they understand uh, the value and the importance of incentives in almost every other facet of government except the criminal justice system. Um, you know, if you're a police officer, uh, 
every incentive points toward you covering up for bad cops because if you don't, you know, they're not going to get your back if you need them. There's going to be enormous peer pressure. Um, you know, there are, I don't know how many stories I've written um, over the years where, you know, there is some sort of blatant uh, act of corruption or police abuse or shooting or beating someone. And the only person who ends up getting disciplined anyway is the cop who, who reported the other cops. I mean, that's a, that's a, it's almost a cliche. It's so common. Um, so, you know, I, we have a system, a criminal justice system is poorly incentivized. We have to start talking about how we reverse those incentives. And I'll give you sort of a good example. You know, one of the policy proposals that's, you know, pretty uh, so, uh, out there in terms of, you know, whether it would ever, ever be sort of politically acceptable, but I think makes a hell of a lot of sense. It's this idea that we should start paying um, settlements or awards and police abuse, police abuse cases, lawsuits out of police pensions instead of out of the public funds. And, you know, it's never going to fly, although, to be honest, I, I never thought repealing qualified immunity would have the support it has today. So who knows? But if you think about how that would operate on the ground, if I'm a cop now, you know, every incentive is pushing me toward uh, sort of going along with the way things have always been, not raising, you know, if I'm a, a sort of a well-intentioned, you know, conscientious cop, every incentive is toward me sort of just going along to get along, looking the other way if my, when other cops are, are corrupt or abusive. Um, but if, you know, if, if, if we're in a system where every time another cop does something uh, that risks a lawsuit, and now it's sort of like my pension is at stake uh, when, when, you know, my partner does something bad, uh, now the incentive, you know, you're pushing back a little bit. And now maybe the incentive is maybe not to report him because that will probably lead to a lawsuit, but at least to sort of, you know, try to get him moving in the right direction and at least, you know, trying to not just sort of going along to get along. What uh, you uh, recently updated a, a story, I guess, that, or a practice that you did, a survey that you did in 2018 of um, kind of uh, uh, studies and stories about systemic racism in policing. Um, you just updated that at the Washington Post. Can you define uh, systemic racism and then the ways in which, you know, just summarize kind of your findings? Because I think part of the confusion here, particularly on the right, is that most people are not, you know, openly racist. They're not uh, George uh, or you know, they're not uh, Strom Thurmond types or anything like that. And so they're slow to kind of acknowledge that there can be uh, racism even if there aren't that many particular racists. But can you talk about what is systemic racism and then what have you found? How does that influence policing? So, yeah, so I think there are a lot of mis misconceptions about what systemic racism is. And I'll be honest, you know, for a long time, I didn't fully understand what it was. Um, it's just, systemic racism is not the idea that everybody, every player within a system is racist on a sort of individual level. It's that the system itself, uh, it, it was, you know, constructed, built, honed uh, at a time when uh, in this country where, you know, racism was sort of written into our laws. It was a, a, a sort of day-to-day -day, uh, fact of life and way of life. And so, you know, the idea that the criminal justice systems that we built um, during the Jim Crow era, even going during Reconstruction, um, you know, which haven't really substantively changed since the end of Jim Crow, the idea that, you um, you know, I don't even think it should be particularly controversial to think that those systems, you know, that had a purpose uh, at that time uh, now, you know, probably haven't shed all of the, the sort of aspects of, uh, of, you know, deliberately wanting racially based outcomes. Uh, they're not just going to sort of shed that stuff overnight. I mean, it has to be purged from them. And we haven't really done a good job of that. And I'll give you a good, you know, my favorite example of this, which is, um, you know, after Ferguson, uh, I went to St. Louis County in Missouri and, and did some reporting, and there's been a lot of subsequent reporting on this. But, you know, St. Louis County has over 90 uh, municipalities within the county, which is an obscene number of, of cities and towns. And the reason for that is in, in during the sort of great, great white flight from the suburbs uh, or to the suburbs from St. Louis, white people would sort of move into a suburb. You know, eventually, sort of black people would also upper class, middle class black people would also move out. White people didn't like that, so they would pick up and move a mile over and start a new town. Uh, and this kind of just kept happening all over St. Louis County. And you've got these sort of what they call postage stamp towns all over, all over the county. Well, every one of those towns also has a town council, or almost all of them have a town council and a police department. Um, and the towns are 
basically funded, uh, well, the, the primary source of funding is supposed to be a sales tax. Well, if you're a poor town, which tends to be the, the blacker towns, you're going to get few, much less revenue from sales taxes. And so they supplement that, or in some cases, their primary source of revenue are fines and fees uh, that they you know, uh, uh, extract from their, their residents. Um, and the, the really sort of per- pernicious part of this that I think you know, is hard for people to sort of understand without knowing that history is that the blacker the town you know, the poorer of the town, probably the blacker of the town. And the blacker of the town, the more reliant they are on these fines and fees. And in all these towns, the police don't actually solve crimes. The county police do that. Their sole purpose is to extract revenue from their residents in order to pay their own salaries. I mean, you know, conservatives always like to joke about the government program that pays, you know, one guy to, to dig a ditch and the other guy to pull it back up. I mean, here you have a police department that solely exists to fi- extract fines from people to pay the salaries of police to police officers. Um, and, you know, a lot of these towns have a black city council or a black city manager. Their, their police departments are, you know, usually more blacker than other police departments. And yet they're doing more harassing of, of their residents than any other town. And, that's- and so that's systemic racism where it's, it, it's, it's independent of almost anybody's um, explicit motivations in a right. system. Right. I mean, nobody's going to argue that the black cops that are harassing people in the black towns are racist. Uh, you also can't argue that that isn't a racist system that is built on a racist legacy. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, we, we, you know, as libertarians, I think we need to recognize that. I also think, you know, the, the whole idea of racism or systemic racism, racial profiling, racism in the criminal justice system, you know, the, the counter that is always, well, you have to look at black crime rates, you know, and look at black on black crime, look at blacks commit a disproportionate number of crimes. As a matter of fact, I mean, a lot of people now are talking about how over, uh, uh, I guess, Memorial Day weekend in Chicago, uh, 18 people were killed on May 31st. Right. But we don't hear about that. Almost all of them black on black. Right. That, that's the argument. Um, but, you know, the... If you look at, for example, stop and frisk in New York City, uh, which is often justified that, you know, that, that look at all the black lives that stop and frisk say because it took guns out of the hands of criminals, right? Well, I can't remember the exact figure, but something like 90 for, per, 95% of the people who were stop and frisk at least didn't find anything, right? So if that's the argument that, you know, look at all the black lives we saved, or, or this is in response to the, the higher proportion that black people commit crimes, what you're saying is those 95% of people who were stopped and frisk who were innocent um, sort of that's fine. And, and that means we're sort of fine with punishing people of one group of a particular group because other members of that group, you know, did bad things. And, you know, that's sort of the opposite of, of individualism, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're sort of treating people based on the actions of other people who look like them. Um, you know, if, if the argument is that, uh, black people commit more crimes, therefore black people, more black people are in prison, you know, that's at least something that we can look at the data on and, and try to figure out. But, you know, the idea that it's that racial profiling and stopping and searching innocent people on the side of the road is OK because those people, you know, are a member of a group that tends to, I don't know, be more likely to engage in drug trafficking. You're, you're excusing, justifying people, or you're, excuse me, you're justifying punishing people based on a member, the, the, the fact that they're a member of a, a racial group. Um, and that is I mean, it's fundamentally unlibertarian. To turn it uh, kind of in the other direction, if libertarians and conservatives often get, you know, the understanding of systems or, you know, in the way you point out, you know, they believe that incentive structure behavior in every way except in, you know, policing, what are the main Gosh. problems? What are the main problems that you see in kind of liberal and progressive critiques of policing or of, of a larger system of oppression? Well, I mean, I think there's there is a uh, a lot of emphasis on um, uh, there, there can be a lot of emphasis on sort of unproven um, uh, uh, sort of social programs that you know I think have maybe contributed to a lot of the problems that we're trying to fight. Um, you know, uh, on these issues, as a libertarian, I tend to you know I mean, I identify more with progressives than with conservatives. Um, so. You know, and I think that for about a generation or two now, conservatives have had kind of the upper hand on this and have kind of implemented their policies almost at will, a lot of times with help from, you know, the Democratic Party, for mm-hmm. example. Um, yeah, it's I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I was just watching a documentary where Charles Rangel, uh, you know, a, a black member of Congress, very influential, talked about his push in the uh, 80s and 90s to uh, increase sentencing disparities between powder and crack cocaine. 
and then recognizing that he actually made a, a significant mistake there. Yeah, and both he and Biden actually, at, at various points, criticized the Reagan administration for not going far enough uh, in the war on drugs. Um, but I guess my point is just that it's, it's, you know, it's hard for me to find a lot of fault with where progressives are coming down on policing issues right now, just because we're in such a hole over the last, you know, several decades of, you know, tough and tougher and toughest on crime policy. Um, you know, a lot of progressive ideas haven't been tried. So it's hard to sort of say, Hey, you're, 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 you know, you're, you're advocating policies that have failed, um, which we can look at. Do you buy into the, uh, you know, I see this uh, adjacent to a lot of protests, um, you know, the idea that capitalism is actually the root cause of all of the sufferings of black people in America? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's hard for me to, to give that much uh, credence because, you know, there's nothing, you know, capitalism is about voluntary exchange. It's about, you know, owning your body and owning the, the, the products of your own labor. Um, you know, I understand the argument that the police sort of exist to protect a, a capitalist system, or that's kind of traditionally um, but how they've, how they've been viewed. Um, but, you know, I, I actually agree with progressives that, uh, you know, policing, you can draw a direct line from modern policing to slavery and slave patrols. Um, uh, in fact, a number of police departments, you know, are direct descendants of slave patrols in, in the um, antebellum South. Um, but, I, but, you know, as a libertarian, I think slavery is sort of the opposite of capitalism, right? I mean, there's no... Um, uh, and there's a lot of debate on this, I know, with the 1619 Project, but you know, I, I firmly believe that you know, capitalism means free exchange, it means you own your body, it means you own, own the fruits of your labors, and, and slavery is antithetical to that. And so to the extent that like, police evolve from the system that tried to protect slavery, I think is a pretty good argument that it doesn't have sort of its roots in capitalism. Right. Um, you have written about the Breonna Taylor case, um, which uh, a, a person who was killed by police uh, just a, a little bit before George Floyd. That case seems to be a horrifying kind of encapsulation of, of the way in which the drug war and, and a whole host of kind of constitutional abuses that go along with the drug war culminate in, you know, in terror of, of innocent citizens. Can you talk a little bit about that? And, um, you know, do you do you think the Breonna Taylor case is is driving enough of the conversation for police reform? Um, you know, I'd like to see it driving more because I think the, those the the use of those kinds of tactics um, are far too common. We're seeing them expanded to being used. You know, it used to be that, that kind of tactic was only used if you were confronting somebody who was in the process of committing a violent crime, right? Where somebody's life was at immediate risk. And what we see in the eighties and nineties is is those those kinds of um, you know uh, dynamic entry, forced entry raids, uh, increasingly and then do dominantly used to serve drug warrants. And it was, a, it was a really a dramatic shift in, in the use of that kind of, of, of violence, government violence, where before you were using it against somebody who was, you know, in the process of committing a violent crime. So, you know, an active shooter or a bank robber or you know, a hostage situation, where now that kind of force is primarily being used against people who are still merely suspected of committing nonviolent consensual crimes. Um, you know, most of these raids are not you know, arrest warrants, they're search warrants. They're still in the investigative process. And a lot of times it's based on dirty information. Um, it, it, it's the, the tactics themselves are extremely volatile and violent. They leave a very, very little margin for error. Um, uh, sorry about that. Uh, they, they leave very little uh, margin for error. And, you know, as we see with Brian, Brianna Taylor, people have, have died because of it. Um, the piece I wrote about Brianna Taylor, you know, it's a, it's a bit, it gets a bit into the weeds on the, the legal history of all this, but it, it's really kind of remarkable. Um, so uh, about a year and a half ago, I, I, I looked at about 100 search warrants, no-knock search warrants that were served in Little Rock, Arkansas. I found that about 95% of them were illegal. Um, they were in direct defiance of a Supreme Court ruling uh, in a case called Richards versus Wisconsin. What the court held in that ruling was that in order to get a no-knock warrant, the police have to show specific information that the person they're going to search is a threat to either you know, attack the police, dispose of evidence, or flee if the cops take the time to knock and announce um, first. And in these warrants I found in Little Rock, every single warrant just had this boilerplate language, cut and paste, almost word for word in most of them, that said that all drug dealers are a threat. 
you know, to, to attack police or dispose of evidence or flee if the police not announced. The Supreme Court has explicitly said that that's illegal. Uh, that is not acceptable. You have to show specific information about that particular suspect. And in Little Rock, you know, they were using, we have video of this, they were using explosives to blow doors off the hinges. I mean, you know, somebody's on the other side of that door, they're lucky to be alive. Um, the remarkable thing is the judges were signing off on these warrants. And I talked to the two judges who had signed most of them, and they were completely oblivious to the fact that they were signing illegal warrants. Um, so is it that they don't read the warrants or they do and they just ignore the Supreme Court ruling or so what, what's the, going on there? So here's the problem. Uh, so a few years later in the Hudson, Hudson versus Michigan, the court ruled that, yes, the knock and announce rule is, is you know, inherent in the Fourth Amendment and it's part of the Castle Doctrine, which is a centuries old law that goes back to English common law. Um, but we're not going to apply the exclusionary rule when the police violate this rule. Uh, and so basically, there's no mechanism to actually enforce this requirement. And so the police, and, and, you know, a lot of us at the time predicted, you know, this is going to be terrible because there's nothing stopping from police from violating. It's just on paper. It's not a rule at all if there's no way to enforce it. Uh, and so that's what we saw in Little Rock. And that's what we saw in the Breonna Taylor case. I looked at the, they had, there were five warrants for that particular drug investigation. And on every one of them, under the, the, the portion where the officer, the detective requested a no-knock, uh, it was the word for word exact same language about drug dealers being, you know, violent or a threat to dispose of evidence. And in Breonna Taylor's case, you know, it was particularly pernicious because Taylor, <clears throat> her involvement in this, you know, drug conspiracy or whatever you want to call it, was that she dated the guy who was under investigation several years earlier. They'd broken up years ago, but she had let him use her address to receive some packages in the mail. That was the extent of it. Now, if they had actually, you know, followed the Supreme Court's, you know, guidance or, or rules in this situation, they would have done a little bit more investigation and they would have had to because the judge would have required it before giving a no knock. And they, you know, they and the judge would have learned that she, her, her connection with to all this was tenuous and that this kind of violence wasn't necessary against her. Um, the packages that the boyfriend, ex-boyfriend received her house were clothing and shoes. There actually weren't even any drugs in the packages. So her only crime was to letting, you know, a former, you know, paramour use her address to receive some clothing in the mail. And for that, they kicked down her door in the middle of the night and her, her then boyfriend, you know, reaches for a, a gun, which he legally owned. In fact, that's another thing. I mean, you know, they would have, if they'd done some research, they would have known that he stayed there. They would have known that he was a licensed gun owner. And they would probably, I would hope, it would have drawn the conclusion that drug dealers tend not to license their weapons with the government. Right. right. Is it, you know, this is a ridiculous question, so I, you know, I apologize in advance for asking it, but is it a sign of progress that charges against the boyfriend uh, who wounded a police officer were dropped immediately uh, in the in the the melee after the Breonna Taylor killing? <laughs> Absolutely, it is. I mean, yeah. the, the Corey May case that you know I sort of started my career with a reason was a great example. I mean, Corey did ten years in prison and several of them on death row uh, for mistaking the cops who were breaking into his home. Uh, again, with a warrant that was probably illegal. Um, and right now there's a guy in Texas who's about to go on trial for, uh, for killing a police officer in a very similar situation. Uh, and in that case, um, the police, you know, admitted that they didn't find, they didn't follow their own policies when they did this no knock raid on the guy's house. And they actually admit that he reached for the gun at the same time that the battering ram hit the door. So there's no way he could have known, right, that they were cops and also they didn't buy any drugs. Um, so yeah, I mean, it is progress. I think the the public pressure probably helped. I think the fact that Breonna Taylor was completely innocent, I think if she had any kind of record at all, it would have been a lot more difficult uh, to persuade the, the district attorney to drop the charges. Um, what are, um, you know, uh, let's talk about reforms. Um, what, are, what are the, you know, top three or five reforms <laughs> that you think can happen uh, that will actually radically shift the way that policing is done in America? I mean, it's an interesting question because if you'd asked me that question a month ago, the the sort of um, uh, Overton uh, window of what was possible is that what you? I mean, yeah, yeah, was yeah. Much I, mean, smaller. I, think, I think what what's possible now versus what was possible a month ago are two very very different questions. Um, you know, I think even before George Floyd, we we saw um, the, the the ball was moving on qualified immunity. I think th thanks in large part to work from uh, from IJ and Cato, who I think have really mainstreamed uh, the the really absurdities that come with the idea that cops should be sort of above the law <clears throat> when it comes to violating people's constitutional rights. Um, 
So I think abolishing qualified immunity is very high on that list. I think reducing the influence of police unions. Can I ask before we get to the union question, qualified immunity, though, uh, Tim Scott, the uh, uh, senator, Republican senator from South Carolina, a black man who has talked movingly in the Senate about his experiences with cops, you know, rouse, rousting him simply for being black. Um, he's ba- he said, you know, qualified immunity is not going to get across the finish line. So um do you think qualified immunity is is a live reform or is it kind of dead on arrival in the U.S. Senate? I mean, I think it's dead on arrival as long as the Republicans hold the Senate. I think there's there's a possibility that, you know, the Senate changes hands that it could it could, <clears throat> it could pass. But I mean, I think to remember that qualified immunity is it's it's judge made law. I mean, it's invented. Um, it is not. You know, if you call yourself an originalist, there's no way you can support qualified immunity. Um, and it's also just absurd. I mean, if we want to talk about incentives. I mean. So in order to, to get past qualified immunity in a lawsuit against a police officer, you have to prove that A, uh, that the officer violated your constitutional rights, and you have to, and then B, you have to show that basically sort of the fact pattern by which the cop violated your rights, that there is established law showing that that fact pattern is unconstitutional. And the way the courts have interpreted this is, is you almost have to have a, you know, spot on, fact for fact, everything has to be exactly identical to a previous case where the court has said, yes, this is a constitutional violation. To, you know, to give an extreme example that no reason is covered, I mean, there are cops who stole, uh, I think it was like $300,000 from people while they were conducting a search warrant on their house, stole their money. And the courts ruled that, well, yeah, that's certainly a violation, but there's no sort of on point existing law saying that it's a violation, so we can't hold these cops accountable. The really absurd thing is, if you think about sort of the, the incentives that, that puts in place, it, it it's actually an incentive for the police to not educate themselves on the latest developments in constitutional law, because the more they know about it, the harder it is for them to say, this wasn't established law and I couldn't have known. Um, and then the other really you know crazy part of this is that the courts, sometimes they'll just move immediately to the second prong. They'll just say, well, there's no previous case on point here. Uh, you know, that matches this fact pattern. Therefore, this is an established law. Therefore, your suit fails. But they never actually rule on whether the actions in that fact pattern were unconstitutional. And so that means the next time the cops do something very similar, they can say, well, there was no established law because you didn't say that this was wrong. You just said there was no established law. And it becomes a self sort of perpetuating problem where the courts never actually hold cops accountable because they never actually, you know, definitively say, no, you can't do that. So uh, qualified immunity is one. Uh, you were about to talk about police unions. How does that, uh, you know, what needs to happen to police unions to uh, allow more accountability? I, I think they need to be abolished, frankly. I mean, um, I, know, I know that's gonna, that's politically pretty difficult, but, um, you know, at the very least, we need to drastically uh, diminish their influence. Um, you know, in a lot of places, Little Rock, again, which I've written a lot about, um, the black black police officers actually started their own union because they felt that the white or the traditional union wasn't representing their interests, particularly um, when it came when you know when a white officer's word conflicted with the black officer, or when a black officer you know um, was facing discipline for reporting misconduct by a white officer. The union would not uh, protect the black officer; wouldn't represent them. Um, the unions are far too influential. They have a massive stranglehold on politicians, particularly in larger cities. Um, if you look at de Blasio, I mean, he ran on a police reform platform, was elected on it, uh, and then said, offered sort of the most tepid kind of milk toast criticism of policing I, I think I've ever seen in a politician, which he told, he, he mentioned in public that he had told his mixed race son, I can't remember what the exact wording is, it was something about, you know, you should be careful when you're around the police, um, which, you know, is fine. Uh, and the, re- the union reacted this massive, like, you know, a show of effrontery and pearl clutching to the point where, you know, they turned his back on him when he tried to give a eulogy uh, at, a, at a police funeral. And it's clear that it, from his action since that that shook him to his very core because he's been nothing but deferential to police. Ever he since. is uh, he is in his own category because literally everybody hates him in New York, but he can win elections with, you know, 60 percent plus of the yeah. vote. So, uh, I mean, he's, he's doing something right while he's very wrong. He could win one now. Though. I mean, yeah. Um, so, you know, what what would go into actually restraining police unions or, or redirecting whatever collective bargaining rights they have? How, how does that work? Um, I mean, it's difficult. I mean, I think I think part of it is just, you know, electing politicians who have the spine to sort of stand up to them and making it clear that that, you know, um, 
there's more of a political price to be paid for capitulating to the police union uh, than than for standing up to them. I mean, I think that's really kind of what it boils down to. Um, they are, you know, they're they're more powerful in some places than others, but they also don't exist everywhere. And the idea that sort of policing will collapse and the cops will, you know, nobody will be want to come up, become a police officer if there are no unions is is belied by the fact that you know in the a large majority of the country, there are no unions and cops are fine. Policing, you know, I mean, they're, they're fine in the sense that, you know, they're not. Yeah. They, they get paid. They, uh, you know, they're not fired for no cause or anything like that. Right. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to fire a police officer, whether there's a union there or not. I mean, uh, that's pretty well established. Are there, are there particular philosophies or theories of policing that, um, that are gaining ground in various places that are, uh, you know, more consistent with the idea of people being able to pursue life, liberty, and the and the pursuit of happiness. Um, you know, is is any of that taking place? Well, uh, so one reform that that I think um, particularly libertarians should be giving a lot, paying a lot of attention to is this group called Cure Violence that um, it operates in several large cities, but but uh, primarily in Chicago. And this is a group; it's an intervention group. So. They operate in high crime areas, and when there's a uh, an incident, you know, a, a homicide or, or you know some some sort of uh, gang activity, for example, you know they they go in and they have they have uh, authority and respect and and credibility in the communities where they operate. Cause a lot of times they hire people who used to be in those communities. They'll hire former gang members. And the idea is that they go in and they intervene and they try to prevent the violence from spreading and they try to prevent you know prevent it before it happens. Um, and there's pretty compelling empirical data in, in Chicago showing that in the in the neighborhoods where they operated, they had a very substantial effect on reducing the homicide rate. In fact, when the, the homicide rate spiked in Chicago several years ago, it, it, it coincided with the city cutting funding to, to clear uh, cure violence. In fact, if you look at the neighborhood-specific data, um, it's pretty overwhelming that this group was doing a very good job. The city cut funding. They were no longer in those neighborhoods and crime, you know, resumed and spiked in those neighborhoods. Um, you know, will it, would that work as a replacement for police? Uh, I don't know. I, you know, probably not, but the idea that, you know, maybe we could redirect, you know, a not insubstantial amount of money that we give to armed, you know, officers of the government patrolling these neighborhoods to, unarmed people who try to resolve things, you know, not with coercion, but with negotiation and talking and, and, and mediation, um, I think is definitely something that's, that's worth looking at. Um, you know, it's hard to kind of say policing has been with us for so long that it, it, in its current form, it's hard to sort of even kind of imagine, uh, a country without any sort of armed police at all. Um, but, you know, I do think we can think creatively about these things. I, I've, I've written a little bit about the defund, the, the term defund, and a lot of the controversy that it's created. But, you know, there are a lot of policies that, that I think libertarians, even conservatives, even police groups support or can support that at least would dramatically reduce the front footprint of police. Um, decriminalizing drugs would take a massive number of cops off the streets. Has it there, the you know, related to uh, kind of drug war issues, uh, you know, most most people in the country now live in a place where either uh, pot, marijuana is legal or has certainly been decriminalized. Is there evidence that in place it, you know, and, and this is the beginning stages of the, uh, you know, of the end of the drug war, which is going to take decades, if not centuries to really unwind, unfortunately. But is there evidence that in places where uh, rec recreational pot is legal and widely accepted. People are buying and selling it legally. Does that have an effect on police abuse? Um, or, you know, is anything, or, you know, are there, is there anything to report on that yet? Uh, so the studies I've seen in, in states that have legalized marijuana is that it dramatically reduces uh, the number of, of arrests, the number of stops, the number of searches, which is all, all very good things. Um, it doesn't uh, really do much on in, when it comes to the racial disparities among the ongoing stops and arrests and searches, um, but it does diminish them overall. It reduces the number of, you know, contacts between police and citizens, which is always a good thing. Um, and, it, you know, it reduces the kind of roadside, you know, harassment that we've seen, uh, which I think is positive. And, you know, uh, it's been a while now, so I'm sure you could sort of cherry pick data to, to make it say whatever you want to say. If you want to say crime has gone down or up since legalization, but we certainly haven't seen the, the sort of explosion of crime that every you know that the the, the uh, you know people were 
pro drug war people were predicting. Um, and if anything, I think I think you know generally crime has either stayed the same or gone down in those states. Are there other uh, reforms that you think are particularly worth kind of focusing on? Yeah, so one that uh, you know Alex uh, Tabarrok wrote about yesterday, I think, and I think a few other people, Connor Friedrich, I think has written about it, um, is. You know, there's no reason why our traffic laws have to be enforced by armed government agents. I mean, um, you know, if you... Well, now you're talking crazy, but this is the type of thing where it's like to say that out loud is to be like, of course, you right. know, it's, it, but, it, but it's it, unimaginable until you actually say it. Yeah, and you start thinking about it. I mean, what does a police, when a police officer pulls, pulls you over, what does he do? He pulls you over, he gives you a ticket, which then you take home and decide whether or not you're going to pay and you send it into mail. Like, why can't you have a, I don't know, some sort of civilian traffic corps who, instead of pulling you over, they see you speeding, they write down your license plate, they call it in, you get a ticket in the mail. I mean, the, the end result is still the same. You get a ticket in the mail that you can pay or choose not to pay and, and, and face the consequences of that. But the, the difference is you're not having this armed you know, interaction slash confrontation with a police officer, which is completely unnecessary. Um, you know, the other thing is we can we, we also need to just kind of divorce uh, the idea that uh, di- we need we need our traffic laws need to be about road safety and not about generating revenue. Um, you know, there are lots of studies done in Europe about, uh, for instance, um, uh, uh, roundabouts instead of stop signs. Um, there have been some really interesting studies about speed limits and how arbitrary they are. Our roads are actually built, uh, you know, imagining people driving much faster than speed limits allow, which means you know, cities and towns can sort of place speed limits wherever they want arbitrarily in a way that sort of maximizes revenue to the city. That shouldn't be the goal of our traffic laws. Our traffic, the goal of our traffic laws should be to keep the seat trees safe. So you could dramatically reduce the size of the police force by stopping traffic enforcement and by, you know, reimagining the way our traffic laws work uh, so that it's not about, you don't have police departments and cities that are reliant because budgets are, I mean, they're just cities that, that, you know, 40, 50 percent of their budget, I mean, they tend to be smaller towns, but are reliant on traffic revenue. And it, and that, you know, police officers in those places know that that's their job. It's to catch people. And this is, uh, you know, it's kind of like the idea of going to school and hating it. it I mean, that idea of the, uh, you know, of a, of a traffic stop or, or you know, um, of of you driving through small towns and, uh, you know, and getting a ticket and stuff like that. It's so deeply embedded in our culture, it's almost impossible to think about a world where you wouldn't always be worried about picking up a ticket. Right. And, and you know, nobody's saying that, that there should be anarchy on the highways, but we could have speed limits that are more organic and are more um, uh, designed or sort of uh, calculated based on how people actually drive. I mean, there's studies showing that the safest speed limit is one that's like, I think, what, what, what the 90th percentile of people drive at. Um, and right now it's far lower than that. Um, and that just creates unnecessary interactions. I mean, if you, if you think about all, if you think about all the police, um, you know, abuse cases or, or deaths or, or beatings that, that originated with the traffic stop, uh, and then sort of escalated from there, you think about all the, the animus and anger and, and, you know, marginalized communities that come from the regular harassment they face from traffic stops you take and take those out of the picture. I mean, you could go a long way toward, uh, you know, uh, rehabilitating kind of the image of the, of the police. And, you know, just those proposals, you know, taking cops out of schools, uh, stopping the, the, the use of cops for to enforce traffic laws, you know, even just sort of um, decriminalizing drugs, not even necessarily legalizing them. Right there, you're eliminating massive portions of, of the police. I mean, that, that I think any of those things would qualify as for defunding the police. And, you know, it would leave a much smaller police force, but it also mean you could pay the cops who were there more. You could you could hire better cops and they would actually be fighting, you know, crime. And so is that, I mean, is is part of the the large issue of reform is really minimizing contacts, uh, particularly um, kind of confrontational co- um, contacts between the police and citizens, because. I recall reading, um, you know, that in any individual stop, it may not be that a black or a Hispanic is more likely to, um, you know, uh, get into, you know, be ticketed or arrested, but they have so many more contacts with the police that essentially it's, you know, over policing is a function or, or, you know, bad things happening is mostly a function of the number of contacts you have with the police. Right. So minimizing the overall number you're going to have a less fraught society. 
Yeah, well, I also think there's there's an inherent power imbalance when you're pulled over and there's this guy who's got, you know, six different weapons on his belt and he's sort of hovering over you while you're sitting in your car looking up at him. Um, and if you're, you know, and if you're a part of a community where this happens to you, you know, I don't know, how many, however many times a month, five, six, seven, ten, some areas, um, you know, yeah, you, we, we, it's easy for us, you know, somebody who looks like me to say, what, well, you should be respectful to cops and polite to them. But, you know, if they're like harassing you and, and, and screwing with you, you know, uh, several times a month, you know, eventually you're going to like kind of lose your patience. And, um, you know, I think we expect people to be perfect in those situations. Um, and, yeah, I think reducing the, the, the number of those contacts uh, is a huge part of this. And, you know, it also creates animus between, it makes it more difficult for police to actually solve crimes in those communities because people don't trust them. I mean, there are polls showing, uh, it was a very recent poll actually showing that uh, black people are more fearful of being a victim of uh, a police beating or police shooting than they are of being uh, victimized by a criminal. Um, and if, if people are more afraid of the police than they are the criminals, they're not going to cooperate with the police to help right. solve crimes. Um, are you optimistic? Final question. Are you optimistic about some kind of serious reform happening in a lot of ways? I mean, it seems, uh, you know, we've been here before at various points where there are ho high profile cases, uh, to his credit, uh, Donald Trump did, uh, sign some criminal justice reform legislation earlier in his presidency. Uh, you know, you go back to, uh, the discussions and, and arguments and conversation that came out of Ferguson. Are you optimistic about police reform and, and how will we know when we got there? Yeah. So, you know, Trump signed, did sign the first step act. I mean, he, he kind of has tried to undermine it ever since he signed it, but the fact that he, you know, wanted kind of the symbolic credit for signing it is, is remarkable. I mean, I think for most of my life, um, you know, the Democrat and Republican nominee for president have fought over to see if would be the, you know, look the toughest on crime. So the fact that people are trying to look uh, like reformers is, is pretty significant. And, and we must say Joe Biden now is essentially walking back almost his entire legislative <laughs> history, right? Which is, you know, I, I, I don't want either. I, I think we should just not have a president for maybe the next eight or 10 years. But it's kind of great to see Joe Biden basically say, yeah, I didn't mean any of that. It was a he's, big mistake. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think, he's, I think, you know, whether you, you find that sincere or opportunistic. Yeah, who cares, right? right. I mean, yeah. if, if he's signing or if he, yeah, you know. But um, uh, I actually am more optimistic than I've been in a long time, even, even than I was at Ferguson, because I do think with Ferguson, again, because of the narrative around Michael Brown that people could sort of seize on if they didn't want to, to sort of sympathize with the protesters that was there. Um, I mean, if you look at polling, it is remarkable. I mean, I, I think it's the support of, for the protesters has jumped 20 points in the last two weeks. Well, and the Washington Post actually just ran a poll that said uh, it was something like 69% of Americans now agree that there is a problem with policing compared to something like 43% uh, right after Ferguson. So, and, and the race aspect, too. I mean, we're seeing large, large majorities now accept the fact that there is, you know, inherent racial discrimination in policing. Um, and, you know, that alone, I think, is, is going to, um, you know, I don't see it uh, fading uh, just because um, I don't think that's the kind of thing that you're convinced on. And then two months from now, you change your mind and <laughs> they're like, oh, well, maybe I was wrong about that. Um, uh, so, you know, the fact that. But is it, can I ask uh, in, in, on the uh, topic of police reform? I mean, there's, you know, there are certain federal laws that can be changed that will have a significant impact, but so much of policing is done at the local and state level. There are so many police departments, there are so many municipalities. Is it, I mean, there is not a switch, right, to just flip things and say, okay, cops, you can't do this anymore. Right. So, what the best thing we can do at the federal level is to, um, uh, remove the kind of perverse incentives that are, are driving bad behavior at the local level. But you're right. I mean, I think most of the reform is going to happen out at the local level. And, you know, what happened in Minneapolis, I mean, it's going to be fascinating to see what, what results from that. Maybe that is too much and maybe they'll, There'll be problems, and they'll have to kind of roll it back a little bit. And they they essentially, I mean, the the city council uh, is effectively abolishing the police department as it exists now, and replacing right. it with a different set of kind of operations. Right, and it's not sort of clear what it's going to look like later. But um, you know, I mean, this says that you know, libertarian, I think, is a good thing. I mean, I think we want to see cities experimenting and trying different things and trying different ways of of you know, walking that line between public safety and, and individual rights. Uh, and, you know, the more that 
try different formulas, the more likely we are we to find one that's going to hit on the right uh, you know equation. And then once we know what works, we can ignore that, right? That's right. Yeah. But I mean, you know, we're already you already are kind of see this. I mean, for years, I, w- I was I was I was harping on the idea that you know it is really easy to influence. Uh, significantly influenced a district attorney's race or a sheriff's race. And it's something that like criminal justice reform people had kind of not really engaged with until about, I would say, four or five years ago. And then we saw them start to engage. And now we're seeing, you know, the, the election of prosecutors across the country who are, you know, former defense attorneys who, you know, are refusing to, to enforce uh, unjust laws or at least deprioritize them. Um, and, you know, that the idea that, you know, that, a prosecutor wouldn't enforce certain laws strikes us as, you know, maybe there's something uh, unjust or unfair about that. That's always the case. I mean, prosecutors have never had the resources to enforce all the laws all the time. There's always a matter of prioritizing. Um, but we, we're seeing prosecutors that are now elected in places that are, they're, they're you know, implementing these reforms, um, less so in sheriff's elections, but we are seeing a little bit of that. And, you know, we're not seeing crime spike in those particular areas. I mean, there are some places where it has, other places where it's gone down. Um, I do think that, you know, if you can't show some sort of dramatic reaction to a prosecutor, to a sort of a progressive or reform minded prosecutor, you know, the fact that less people are being uh, rolled into the criminal justice system, that less people are you know, having their lives ruined with the criminal record or sitting in jail for six weeks, waiting for six months, waiting for charges, um, you know, that all in itself is inherently a good thing. And, you know, I think you have to show some pretty severe consequences in terms of crime uh, in order to offset that good that's being done and we really haven't seen that well we are going to leave it there we've been talking with radley balka of the washington post about criminal justice reform police abuse systemic racism radley thanks so much for talking my pleasure thanks